Welcome, fellow patriots, citizens of the United States of America. At least I would assume most all of you are American citizens, and it is right now 12.57 a.m. on July 1st. And so in just a few days, it's going to be America's birthday. And we're going to celebrate on the 4th of July what happened back in 1776. And so for America, this is like a high holy day, or at least it is for me and for most Americans, I would, I would hope. But we're back on corona quarantine. There's been a spike in cases of the virus, especially here in Harris County or in the area of Harris County where Houston is. And so the shutdown, if you will, or the stay-at-home orders are back in place more or less. And there's a requirement in our area to wear a mask in public places. Well, this seemed to me to be the appropriate mask, but it is a little bit hot and steamy and difficult to talk through. So I'm going to, I'm going to pull it off. And usually the class before the 4th of July, the last couple of years, I asked my students to dress up in some kind of red, white, or blue, or combination thereof. And we took a group picture. I should try to include that in here. I'll see if I can splice it in maybe at the end. And if you stay after the fade at the end, I can show you the awesome socks and the red, white, and blue patriotic kicks I'm wearing. And I know I've already posted these on Facebook, but you need to see them again. I mean, it, it, it'll just light you up with patriotic joy. But on the class before the 4th of July or closest to the 4th of July, I know I do a little bit of, I do a lot of goofing off, sort of like the last class before Christmas break in school. Well, we're going to do some serious study here in a minute, but I'm going to take a couple of minutes to do a little bit of chatting and show and tell and talk about um, my garment here and explain what that is behind me there. But I wanted to give a shout out to our brother Jack Harris, a buddy of mine, great encourager and a wonderful teacher in our congregation here who has taught the Word of God for many, many years and he knows my love for all things Americana and he got me this awesome little Uncle Sam doll, and I keep it here in the classroom. Look at that thing. Is that not, is that not the greatest? I love that, Jack. I absolutely love it, and um, sometime I'll have to show. Maybe I'll do a walkthrough of my office and splice it in on one of these videos, my church office and my home office, all red, white, and blue, and just a glorious... Uh, flag imagery and all kinds of good stuff like that. But you'll be excited to know if you didn't know this already and if you're watching this from the future, I mean way off in the future, I don't even know if the Nabisco, the Nabisco company will exist anymore or if Oreos will exist anymore, but they do now. And look at what came out for, yes, for this season, 4th of July season, these red, white, and blue Oreos. I mean, when I saw these in the store, I nearly passed out for sheer happiness. I was so overwhelmed with happy that, you know, I grabbed some of these and mm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat one at the fade when we finish class at the end. And I'm sure they're going to taste like Liberty, and I hope with 4th of July coming, I hope you celebrate and watch fireworks. I know in a lot of places there won't be fireworks because of the corona situation, but watch the fireworks from Boston if they're having them where they have the Boston Pops play and then they show the fireworks. That's always a, a tremendous display of, uh, of fireworks that, that is almost unparalleled in the nation. It's certainly one of the best. And if you have your beverage, of course, now look, look at this. When you have a beverage out of a glorious cup like this, 
let me tell you right now, it's not artificially sweetened, it's not chemically laced, uh, but it is refreshing. Taste like liberty. Yes. Okay. I know I'm goofing around a lot here. Thank you for bearing patiently, patiently uh, with me as we have a little fun here and as I stumble over my words. Um, so for the shirt, all right, I love the shirt. It's got Lady Liberty, uh, of course, the stars and the stripes. And the wife's, the wife's matches mine. It's the pretty white version of it. And of course, she's a little bit shorter than I am. But when we stand together, uh, people behind us can see, and you know, she's of diminutive stature. So she's a little adorable petite lady, my wife. So there it is, baby. 1776, not 1619. That's a bunch of propagandistic garbage. But that's a discussion for another time. All right, let me take this out of the way and let's get rolling here. Um, I neglected to walk back here with my beverage. Let me make sure the audio, yes, everything looks like it's rolling fine. Sorry. If you had to look at that close-up of my mug, my face, not this mug, my face. All right, well, as usual, I'm going to be going back and clarifying and sorting a few things out here. Oh, and I did, I did put this up for better viewage here. Um, notice the stripes there. I really should turn the lights off to show how awesome that looks, but I've got a close-up. Let me see if I can zoom that. Zoom that in. Yes, look at the red, white, and blue layers. Look at it. Um, here's a cool pic I found of them. Isn't that neat? Look at that. Oh man. Whoops. We need to. Uh, we need to. There we go. <laughs> wow. That's what we need. Wow. The red, white, and blue. It's like. Christmas in your mouth. I'm sure it's going to be that way. I know. I just, I, well, I've already had some, of course, but when I have mine after class. Now, let me just leave that yumminess up there while I explain something. I, I was, I think, quite unclear in something I said last time about Acts 319 and the uh, uh, King James Version using uh, the passive be converted when I said in modern versions, it's translate uh, turn with an active verb, turn or turn again or some equivalent like that. And I said that was because of the Calvinistic leanings of the King James translators, but I never did explain uh, what I meant by that. So what I mean is in Calvinism, there's this idea that Salvation is entirely the work of God and that man is holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y. This is how they say it in their doctrine. Man is holy or entirely passive. And so salvation is really something God does to you and gives to you apart from any activity on your part. And so you can see then how they would want to say, well, you don't convert or turn you are passive and you are to be converted by God. That's what I meant. And I didn't really explain that very well. But the Greek text, in the Greek text, it is an active voice verb. I think that's uh, epistrepho there. And it's in the active voice. So it's simply incorrect to render it with a passive. Uh, I didn't really adequately explain that. And I do think you just need to see a quick shot of this, if you'll let me. Um, yeah, there you go. Okay. You're welcome. You're welcome, everyone. Now, what we were discussing last was the theme in Luke Acts of wealth and the proper use of wealth. And I know I already went through that point for the most part. I, at the very end of class, I said I might go back and get in a couple verses that we had to just mention and pass over. But what I'm doing here, oh, the timer, people, the timer. How hard is it? 
to remember the timer every time that we start class. All right, I'll just, I've got to do this again. My apologies for having to do this, but in last time the class was an hour and five minutes and I barely stayed under my record length of an hour and 10 minutes. I don't want to do that again. All right, so we've already been 10 minutes in the class or a little more than 10 minutes, about 10 and a half minutes. I'll try to take that into account and let's go so we can go through this. So what I did is I went back and sort of reordered these points uh, in a way that I hope will be a little bit more helpful. And this is file number 25 and last time I had to divide number 24 up into 24A, 24B because the file was too large and that happens to me sometimes when I get too many slides in it. But under the warnings about wealth, I wanted to say it this way. This is sort of a, I think, a better way to, to just put before you or catalog for you what we're seeing in Luke and in the book of Acts when you take them in toto, what we're seeing about the issue of wealth. And we're seeing really the need to be responsible stewards of our money. Of course, all the Gospels bring that out, uh, or touch on it at least, but not like you see, not with the emphasis you see on it in Luke, as we've already stressed. But First of all, there's to be the honest acquisition of wealth. And that's from the text where John is answering the people when they ask him, when he tells them to repent and they say, well, what shall we do? And we already looked at that verse. We're not going to go back through that. And then we're also to be responsible stewards of what God has given us. We need to give to the poor. We need to give to others who are in need, whomever that may be. But then it also means a willingness, and here this is a tricky one. I know the ethics of this gets uh, complex and you have to think about it on a case-by-case -case basis, but forgiving people who owe you. In other words, lending without expecting to, that you have to be repaid. And here it will do us well to, this is now new stuff that I didn't have in class last time, but I want to compare Luke's reference to some of Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mountain, I want to parallel Matthew's record there in Matthew chapter 5 and what he says. And notice uh, so that you can see clearly how much more extensively Luke touches on this. In other words, how much more he tells us what Jesus said. And Luke either repeats it or Jesus repeated it. And Luke... Um, strung these thoughts together this way or else the Lord uh, said it this way, but it's different than what you find in Matthew, even though it's essentially the same text. Now look, for example, Matthew chapter 5. Let me get this one off the, out of the picture here. Matthew chapter 5, this is where he said, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. I say unto you, don't resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. All right, now here's the, the thing we're getting at about wealth. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Wow, you talk about provocative. I mean, that, that, is a, that is absolutely stunning statement that really throws you back and makes you do a lot of thinking. So notice verse 41, and if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them too. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. So that's it. As far as someone who asks you for something, someone who wants to borrow from you, there's that one statement there in Matthew chapter 5. And that's when he goes on to say, uh, you should love your enemies. You've heard it said, love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. But I say even love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, and etc. And you go on uh, where he then talks about, uh, that makes you like God. You shall therefore be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. But now, let's look at Luke. When Luke has these things in here, they're, they're sort of jumbled together. And I don't think Luke's being haphazard, but uh, it's not in the same order. But laced throughout it here, you see these references to lending. So look what I mean. Here he says, but I say to you, love your enemies and do good to those who harm you. So right away here, this is dealing with something further down in the text in Matthew about loving your enemies. So notice he says, love your enemies and do good 
to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To the one who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also. Now, here's where we see, um, look, look at now we get to some of the same language. Uh, from one who takes your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. All right, now here, here you see as well. Give to everyone who asks from you and from one who takes from you your goods. Do not demand them back. Now that's essentially the same. And then there's the golden rule that's not in Matthew till two chapters later in this speech, where, and as you wish that others would do to you, do, so do to them. So either Jesus was saying it differently and in different order on this occasion, which is certainly possible and likely that he put these things together in, with a different emphasis and a different um, order at different times, at different situations with different audiences. And I think I used the word different about eight times in, in a row there. But um, it's also likely that Luke has access to these sayings. And similar, as we've said, like with the Q document uh, here, essentially, and that he is uh, the hypothetical Q document, I should emphasize. But then notice he says, and if you love only those who love you, what benefit is that to you? Well, that comes way down later in Matthew's account. Uh, look at that way down in verse 46. But here he's going to continue, for even sinners love those who love them. Now, as he continues, notice, and if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? Even sinners the same? Okay, verse 34, and if you lend to those, so now he wants to make the same point again, but talk about money. Talk about lending. Talk about giving to someone. You see how this appears in these texts. It's much more of an emphasis. It's something Luke really wants to make sure he includes in his account. So if you lend to those from... Uh, to those from whom you expect to receive, well, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies. Now, now see how he throws in love your enemies? You see how it's out of order? But then he says again, do good, expect nothing in return. So in other words, it's not being generous. It's not, being good, uh, it's not showing good stewardship with our wealth if we give to other people, but only when we know we'll be repaid. And that, obviously you see Jesus saying that. The good stewardship of our money is being generous, uh, lending, and if someone can't repay, showing, showing that generosity, forgiving the debt when it's possible to do so. Now that doesn't mean you should let people take advantage of you. And that's a whole nother subject to explore that further. But look how it ends. Look at the difference in how the texts end. Where at Matthew he says, uh, therefore you'll be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And then look over here though, in Luke's account, he says, you will be the sons of the most high. Here he says, uh, as your heavenly father. Here he says the most high. Several times in Luke, and I believe it's only in Luke where God is referred to as the Most High. Ah, oh, that would be a great thought to explore. But notice he says, For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Look what he parallels with evil. People who aren't grateful. Because Luke is stressing here the need to be hospitable and to show generosity and kindness and concern. And that's really hard to do with people who aren't grateful uh, for what you're doing. Be merciful, he says. Now over here in Matthew's account, it's be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Here it's be merciful even as your father is merciful. Wow, that would be a great text just to take those two and then show how what Matthew says and the way it's said there is more in line with Matthew's themes and then show how the difference in terminology and concepts here is more in line with Lucan emphases. Now that would be a great little assignment, overnight uh, one-page assignment that I would give to students if this were a school of preaching situation and I were teaching in a class like that and might even ask uh, some of my students here I'll, I'm, let me encourage you to do that. Think about that. Look, look more closely at the differences and the similarities in the, that parallel text. Okay, I know I spent a lot on that, so I've got to really hustle because, you know, I was goofing around there at the beginning. So um, we need to use our funds to promote 
fellowship and to extend hospitality. And that comes up in the text in Luke 14 that we've already uh, looked at uh, more than once, I believe. Show proper planning for the future. I know I mentioned this text hurriedly last time with a parable of the unjust steward. Where, and that's a very challenging text. But what I want us to notice is in all of that, there's no one-size-fits-all prescription for what you should do with your money. You see it's going to depend on you and your personal situation and the opportunities that you have presented to you. So he's not making broad, uh, uh, sweeping uh, you know, prescriptions that will apply uniformly, but these texts challenge us, each of us, in our individual situation. So they're, they're concerned with how we all are treating each other, but that's going to have to be worked out as each of us struggles with uh, our own wealth and our own position and where God has put us and being good stewards of all of that. It's, it's really, it really is a, a challenging area. But, the, but clearly what is worst of all in Luke, the one thing that is worst of all is to do nothing. I should have paused there and asked you to think about that for a minute. To do nothing. You, you know, we might think, well, as long as I don't take from other people, as long as I'm not actively exploiting other people and not harming other people, oh, no, 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 no. Look at the rich fool. The rich fool, he just kept all that he had and, and built up all that he would need, he thought, uh, uh, to, to be secure in himself and to take care of himself. And it wasn't that he actually did anything harmful to others. It's what he didn't do about his own soul and using it would be apparent in the context of Luke what he should be doing with his wealth as far as showing generosity like the rich man and Lazarus. Now, it wasn't that he actively harmed Lazarus, but he ignored a beggar in need at his gate who only wanted the crumbs that fell from his table. He would have been more than happy just to have the scraps he throws in the garbage, but he was just indifferent, oblivious to it. So his sin was that he did nothing at all. Or the rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and Jesus said, all right, well, there's, there's one thing you lack. You need to sell everything and give to the poor. And then come and follow me. And he goes away with sorrow. Uh, I believe that's Mark that tells us about his emotion there. But uh, it's not that he then goes away and actively harms other people. But the implication is, at least we don't see anything of him after this, that, that uh, he just d d it's what he didn't do. So if you want to say, uh, sometimes we hear it said this way. If you want to ask, well, what do I have to do to be saved? Well, you need to hear and believe and respond to the gospel and all that that uh, involves. So we can give a specific answer as to what you have to do to be saved. But if someone says, well, what, what do I have to do to be lost? Nothing. Nothing. And so this is really quite frightening and to think that it's not... It's not necessarily sinful things I'm actively doing to others, but what I'm failing to do for others that I should be doing. That will preach. Write it down, Miss Olivia. That would be a great sermon if, you, if anybody's got a list going. So I talked about this last time, but I want to I wanna make it better. Okay, so I wanted to add a thought. God's reign, in other words, as far as this emphasis in Luke on showing generosity toward the poor and needy, that... He's showing us that the reign of God, the kingdom of God, it brings about this reversal that we've already talked about. There's a whole reversal of values, a complete opposite way of thinking from the world. And that results in a whole reordering of life and the whole social order. The, it's, it's sometimes said that Luke's gospel is more political than the other gospels as far as addressing the community concerns or the, of the broader public. And so it results in a whole change in the social order. But I wanted to add this, that reordering is along the lines of God's just, of God's just and holy character, His just and merciful character, where there is mutual love and concern for everyone. 
that we're all equal and free to pursue holiness unhindered. And that's a thought we introduced earlier where um, you see that in the Benedictus, and that's something Zechariah says there about the Messiah setting us free and liberating us so that we can pursue holiness. That's the freedom we have under the reign of God. But uh, that, again, that, that would be another whole other lesson to explore that. But this idea of, of the gospel, think about it, the gospel resu- resulting in a more in a society that's ordered along the lines of justice and equality for all. Well, doesn't that sound like the, that reminds me of the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, uh, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Equality, not, not equality of outcome, but equality of opportunity. Uh, it's not where we can sort of have elites who will engineer society along this utopian lines where we can, we, there are elites who want to, what we call, they want to do what we call um, social engineering is the term I was looking for, where they think they can, uh, by, by their expertise, sort of uh, take over all of, uh, all of the society and, and essentially where the government runs everything and they can create a just and fair outcome, equality of outcomes for everyone, which actually ends up being monstrously unjust in the attempt to do that. It's a gross perversion. That's socialism, that's communism, that's brought so much misery and ruin. But if people want to see a taste of, see, America does give, we have not fully lived up to our charter to, to have a society where there is always equality under the law. But we are the freest, fairest, most prosperous nation in the world since we're talking about Independence Day coming up and all. And that all men, you know, the, the, in the declaration that all men are created equal, equal before the Lord. Well, if we're still struggling to see that fully realized in our society, people ought to see in the church. They ought to see in the people of God what a just and fair treatment of one another looks like. And as the church is allowed to influence the culture and influences the institutions of the culture and the people who make up those institutions, it helps reorder the society along those lines. But of course, we look to the ultimate, the final culmination of the reign of God where we have the consummation of all things in the new heavens and new earth. Well, that that will be finally, fully and perfectly Realize is my understanding. Okay, so we uh, we already talked about all that. Let me jump ahead here. Yes, and uh, this whoops, this great great point that the church should reflect and help uh, help bring about this vision of God's reign, this bringing in of a new order along those lines we talked about. Okay, so eighteen plus eleven or so. Okay, let me see what I can do with this great. Great, extremely important topic, and my apologies to the League City congregation. There are others who are taking this class who have been messaging me and in contact with me. They're in the process of taking these lessons, and they won't get to hear some of the preaching I want to do that supplements the class periods that we have. So um, I want to include in the class some things that I would normally just say, you know how I often get to something and I'll say, okay, uh, I'm not going to say any more about that because I'm going to preach a sermon on that tonight or I'm going to preach a sermon on that next week and then I'll, I'll just uh, go past that and then we'll address it in a sermon. Well, I want to get it all in and hear and you're going to have to hear me, my apologies, address these things again in a couple of sermons that I want to do, but the repetition won't hurt and it will only help, I think. So I'm at I'm at little, I'm over 30 minutes, 31, 32 minutes or so. Is that about where we are? Let's see what we can do here. But it's 
quite clear when you get to Luke that it's different from the other Gospels, not just the synoptics, but from John as well, and that there's a lot of eating going on. That, that alone should make Luke a favorite of a lot of us. There's a lot of talk about eating and a lot of references to meals and meal situations. So 19 meals mentioned in Luke and six of those are also mentioned elsewhere, but notice, notice that, look at that, 13, 13 are only in Luke. So there are 13 meal, there are 13 eating situations you only find in Luke. Look at how many parables about banquets. And you can see here, obviously, that um, Luke decided to put uh, several of them in chapter 14. And in chapter 15, that's when the prodigal son comes home. And what, what do they do? They eat, right? I mean, that's what we do in the church when we get together. That's what we should do. We need to do more of that. Break bread together. God made eating at, not just as a way to fill your stomach, to meet the needs of your body, but to be a, a social experience where he, he doesn't want like mom to go in the bedroom in front of her TV and watch Home and Garden and dad is watching something on YouTube and he's in, in, he's in the, the den and then the kids are all looking at their phones and eating in different parts of the house. I know maybe once in a while you, 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 run, you go through the Taco Bell drive through and you get some, some junk food and maybe everybody's just eating in the car or wherever they can. But I mean, regular meal time is so important for, for the bonding dimension. And when you sit down face to face as a family or as a spiritual family with your brothers or sisters in Christ, with anyone, God has, I, I truly believe, it's, it's my opinion, I can say, I don't have a a verse that spells it out explicitly this way, but I think you would agree when you look at, especially what's in Luke and Acts, that God designed eating to be a time of fellowship. And that's why we often call our eating together fellowship meals. So there's this celebration. And in fact, heaven and the, the final culmination of the messianic age and the whole consummation of God's reign when we're finally all where God dwells with us for all of eternity, that is prophetically depicted as a, a feast, like one of the feasts of the Jews. So there's feasting. Chapter 16 mentions the, the um, rich man faring sumptuously at his table every day. And so, again, the table is mentioned. And here's another way that, to categorize. There's a lot of passages here, and normally I would go through maybe and pick a few of them and just give you an idea of what we mean. But I'm going to leave these here for your reference, and they're in the file, number 25. And if I can't, this is another large file. If I can't get it to upload uh, the way I want it to, it'll be 25A, 25B. Hopefully I can get it all in one file. But you notice it's in Jesus' teaching in the book of Luke, there are frequent times when he's teaching, he's talking about meals. But it's also in the narrative where meals are mentioned or there's a discussion of Jesus in an eating situation with someone. And then, of course, when you get to the book of Acts, we find in this very important text that we'll look at if we, if we hustle here, where the early church, Luke wants to show us how this was the practice of the early church, to break bread together, to eat food in one another's homes. And you see other references to that uh, later. And we're going to come back to the Cornelius text. And the jailer feeds Paul. They, they sit down at his house in chapter 20, verse 11, when Paul's in Troas, when they worship and then they eat together. And that's something a lot of us do with one another that we need to do more. But notice, this, um, this was likely, you remember, Luke is the, the, the gospel that seems most oriented toward the Gentiles. And so, and Jack and I were talking, when I've talked about the different reasons that God gave us different gospels, one of the reasons is, you know, different audiences were being addressed and the material is being ordered and the emphases are being given that would best suit that particular audience. Well, Luke's gospel, this whole meal setting seems to be influenced by the idea of the symposium. The symposium 
is the common meal. In, in Greco, in Greek and Roman culture, that was a, a meal which was sort of a, a, a formal banquet, sort of like a dinner party, you might think of it. And often the host would use the occasion to give some instruction. But these meals were a big deal and how they were carried out and all of that. In fact, the significance of table fellowship, this is why it becomes so important. See, here we're getting into, we, we just talked about the theme. This is a theme in Luke Acts. Here's a great way to distinguish between the theme and the theology. You see the theme by just noting how frequently it's mentioned in narrative and discourse and how it's unique to Luke and Acts. But what does it mean? What's the the Why is it so important? Well, it does reveal to us, now here's a fancy way of saying it, Lucan Christological, Soteriological, and Ecclesiastical themes. Okay, Rose, right? We were talking about that. That's the way Rose said it to me when we were talking about it over table fellowship recently when we were eating some Chick-fil-A uh, together. But no, no, really, all we're saying here is the, the table fellowship teaching and scenes in Luke Acts, they show us, all this means is it, show us, it shows us something, what, what Luke is saying about Christ, what he's saying about salvation, what he's saying about the life of, of God's people in the church. That's what we mean. So it, in other words, these meal settings, they're showing us important theological emphases. They're, they're a vehicle by which Luke is showing us the emphases that he wants to make about Jesus and about salvation in the church. So it's really, it's the principal metaphor, I think, for depicting the whole social reality of the kingdom of God. I think uh, that's a good way of saying it. Well, what are two things that it shows us? All right, so we're at about 37 or 38 minutes here. Let me keep Keep an eye on my time. Well, table fellowship, let me show you two important theological themes that, that relate to what we just said. The idea of inclusion. See, this shows us something about Christ. It shows us something about salvation. And it shows us something about the life of the people of God. So uh, it shows us, first of all, this idea of inclusion in the kingdom of God. Now, it's it's something we can't really appreciate because meals don't always convey that in our culture in the way that they did in first century culture and in the ancient world and still in some places in the world today, in many places. But in the both Jewish cultural environment of the ancient world and in Greco-Roman cultures, meals, to be invited into someone's home and sit down and share a meal with someone conveyed a the idea that in some way, on some level, there, you were being accepted by that person. Okay, well, that might seem obvious enough, but really when you look at the importance placed on the, the table fellowship, and I didn't mention earlier that we say table fellowship. There are some texts, like the King James Version will have passages where the verb for reclining, which can just mean to recline, to lie down, but often means to recline at a table, like a low table to the ground. They didn't have tables like we do with, uh, with tall chairs like we do, but oftentimes the food would be on a table that was set on the floor, and then you would lie down, you would recline at an angle. I should have had a picture here, I'm sorry. So. The way um, the King James will have that recline, where some versions have recline at table, the King James will say, sit at meat. Sit at meat. I think it's 1 Corinthians 8.20 where the King James will say, uh, uh, talking about sitting at meat, where other translations will just say to eat or to have a meal. And uh, let me make sure I gave you the correct reference there because I had meant... To mention that when we first got to table fellowship. Yeah, it's, and it's actually 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 10, sitting at meat, where the ESV will say eating, but it'll have a footnote where the Greek is really reclining at a table. Well, what do you do at a table? You eat at the table. So the New American Standard Version will have dining 
And so that's the idea. That's what we mean by table fellowship, not just having fellowship, but enjoying that fellowship in the context of a, a meal together at a table. Uh, I mean, I know that sounds obvious enough, but I didn't want to assume that I didn't really explain the terminology. It revealed, these meal settings revealed something about social ranking and something about group solidarity, like the people that were welcome at your meal and the people that weren't welcome. Uh, it, it was a way of, of showing, you know, who your group was. Well, if you were uh, welcomed into the meal, then that made you a part. That showed the approval from that group. And where you sat and how you were treated at that meal could be a reflection of your social status. So think, for example, uh, that can be reflected in the etiquette that would be typical for a meal. In Luke chapter 7, when, a Simon, when Simon the Pharisee invited Jesus in to eat, so there's the Luke in generosity. He actually has Jesus going into a home of a Pharisee to eat, and he's named Simon the Pharisee. And a woman comes in. That's where the woman anoints Jesus' feet with her tears and wipes them with her hair, and, and everyone is shocked. And they're shocked, not so much that someone came in, because often they would be eating in rooms that were open to the, to the public. People could often see or easily have access to where they were eating. So it's a lot different than the way we eat when we sit around the kitchen table or in the dining room and have company and sit down and eat together, or even sit around in the living room and balance plates on our laps and, uh, you know, we have an a eating situation like that. They're, they're shocked that Jesus was letting this woman touch him because Luke says she was a sinner. That's something that Luke uses more, that, that reference, than in the other Gospels. But then look what Jesus says when he rebukes Simon. As he explains the lesson, we're not going to go into it, but in verse 44, Luke 7, 44, then turning to the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? He said, I entered your house and you, you gave me no water for my feet, but she's wet my feet with her tears, wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. See the formal greeting? customary greeting rather but from the time I came in she has not ceased to kiss my feet you did not anoint my head with oil N notice some of the customs that are mentioned just in passing by Jesus here so in other words he invited Jesus to eat but he didn't really bestow on him some of the customary etiquette that um, or gracious acts that you would normally give to someone uh, in that situation but this idea of meals showing acceptance and inclusion, that fits with Luke's emphasis on Jesus. You remember how we said one of the themes is the acceptance of the outsiders, those who, were, who, who were, tended to be overlooked, who were marginalized, who were without power or status. Ah, like, for example, in chapter 14, when Jesus talked about, um, when Jesus talked about, uh, there he said, uh, verse 12, to the man who had invited him uh, to eat, when you give a dinner or banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. See, a lot of times there was this, what's called reciprocity, this idea of if someone had you for a meal, then if you were of that same uh, social status or higher or depending on where you were, you were expected to reciprocate and have that person over as well. So there was these social pressures and expectations there. Jesus said, don't, don't. He's, he's going against the social order here. That's what we mean by reordering society along the lines of God's character. He said, when you, when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you'll be blessed by your Father. You'll be repaid at the, oh, I love that, the resurrection of the just there at the very uh, bottom of the screen. But then also the, the passage here, then he goes on. Look at verse 15. This is a great passage to show you the importance of the idea of eating at a meal. Right here, verse 15. When those, one of those who reclined at table with him heard these things, he said, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. So notice he talks about participation in the kingdom of God as eating bread. 
in the kingdom of God. And then Jesus goes on to give the parable of the slighted invitation where everyone made excuses and, and didn't come to the man's banquet. And so he sent out his servants and said, bring in the poor, the blind, the lame, the crippled, and, and all of that. But notice the idea of what's going to happen in the kingdom of God. We're going to eat bread together in the kingdom of God. So notice these kinds of emphases over and over. I want to make sure I didn't leave something out. Okay, so 34. We're at 44 minutes. All right, let's see if we can get these last few verses in here. And that's when he went on to say, uh, well, no, I want, I want to make sure to include this. I think uh, I should have here at the very bottom. Maybe I didn't see it, but yes, wow, way down here. Okay, let me put it in there. In chapter 13, going back a chapter, look at this, uh, where Jesus is talking about those trying to get admittance. Uh, to heaven in the last day and he says um, then then you will begin to say but we ate we ate and drank in your presence see lord lord we belong to you well what's proof of that we ate in your presence you see that and then he says you taught in our streets and that's when jesus goes on to talk about the heavenly state in terms of people coming from the east and the west from the north and the south verse 29 and what will they do? This is how the ESV, I'm sorry, wrong tool again. Recline at table in the kingdom of God. That's how Jesus describes this blessed condition when we'll get to eat together with the king in his kingdom. So this idea of inclusion, now that extends into the book of Acts. And that's important because remember the book of Acts the book of Acts in chapter 1 in chapter 1 and verse 1 remember Luke makes it clear that what we're seeing in the church is an extension of Jesus work that it, that that the first book Luke, the gospel of Luke is what Jesus began to do so then we're seeing what Jesus continues to do in the life of the church and that's ah I'm getting my tools mixed up and that's when we find in Acts 2:42 notice um, here, they devoted themselves, verse 42, to the apostles' teaching and, and the fellowship. Fellowship was very important to, I think this may be a reference to the communion, the breaking of bread, notice he says, with the definite article there, and that's why it's that way, apologize, uh, that's why it's that way in the ESV. But then, of course, as you continue then down in verse 46, and day by day, what a great text here, day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they receive their food with glad and generous hearts. That's important to Luke for us to see. This was then the habit of the early church there in Jerusalem. They spent time together. And how did they do that? Eating with one another. So they ate their food together. It's very important in uh, conveying this theme. Whoops. So the idea of inclusion, it showed unconditional acceptance that here in the church now, it didn't matter what your social status was. It didn't matter where you were from. It didn't matter who you were, that now in Christ you would be accepted. And how was that shown? They would sit down and eat together. They would eat together and share food with one another and that was a beautiful reflection of, of the, the work of Christ to make us one and to bring us together and make us a people and a people who all stand before God equally and who have this mutual love and concern and, that is, and a mutual fellowship that is enjoyed when we eat together, when we eat with one another. So we're not just eating food. We're not just having a piece of pie. As important as it is to have cherry pie together often, it's more than just the pie. It's the fellowship. And that's in tremendous contrast with the exclusivist purity and legal systems of the Jewish leaders where you couldn't be welcome at a meal if you weren't ritually purified and unless you complied with all the ritualistic requirements you could not be accepted into the temple area and to that all of that with all of the conditions and all of the trappings and all the exclusions and all the limitations how different where we see in the church 
everyone's just getting together and eating together. And you see the importance of, you see the theology of a common meal together when Peter goes to Cornelius, all right, <laughs> 50 minutes, we've got to hurry, but, but I'm almost done. When Peter goes to Cornelius, and you remember he goes in, this is the first time an uncircumcised Gentile receives the gospel, and what is the problem the church has? When Peter gets back to Jerusalem, they're concerned, and they criticize him, and they take issue with him because what? What was the issue? How was it expressed? In chapter, Acts chapter 11 and verse 2, so when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him saying, you went to uncircumcised men, notice this, and you ate with them. You ate with them. You know, the Jews didn't do that. To actually eat with someone was a big deal. It showed acceptance. It showed a kind of or a certain level of communion and participation with one another. And so Peter had to explain to them. Peter had to go on and explain to them, no, God showed it to me. God, by pouring out the Spirit on them and the vision that I received and all the ha how the hand of God was involved to show me that we're to accept the Gentiles. And so it was okay to eat to eat with them. So you see that idea? Oh, I love how this all comes together. We're going to see how this all comes together now. It not only shows inclusion, that inclusion, this is, this is important because that acceptance at a meal, this is a great quote from Eliot, it gives concrete social expression to the inclusive character of the gospel, of the kingdom of God, of the Christian mission. See, it's one thing to say, you know, well, the gospel is for all. And everyone's welcome in the kingdom of God. But that becomes concrete. That abstract idea becomes a reality in table fellowship. You see it? Isn't that a great way to, to think of it? But it also shows Christ's presence. So let me think. 41 minutes. We're at 51 minutes. We should really wrap this up. Let me just say... And we will do a sermon on this. So those of you taking the class but aren't here for the sermons, you can go to the League City Church of Christ, and I can refer, to, I can refer you to uh, where that lesson will be. Well, we'll talk about this. And we did in a lesson recently where we talked about the uh, communion, the cup of communion. I think I called it the, the cup of blessing was the title of it, where I talked about the fact that even though we're separated because of the corona restrictions, the quarantine restrictions, that uh, the, the communion still unites us. That it, the Lord's Supper is a communion. It's a union. That it's something that unites us all together where we have this mutual uh, participation in the presence of Christ. So uh, I'll refer to that later, but it, in Luke's account of the Lord's Supper, it's unique. And I'm just going to go ahead and plow through this because since since I don't have you sitting here in class and I'm not holding you and keeping you from leaving and you can stop it and watch the rest of it anytime you want or you can tear through it at your leisure, um, let me just press through this. So notice the, the unique elements, how Luke's account of the Lord's Supper is different and you've probably noticed this before, but notice how it, some of this is worded in Luke. So when the hour came, what does it say? He reclined. <laughs> I'm really struggling with my tools palette here. He reclined at table, right? He reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, now this is only in Luke. This is only in Luke. His desire, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. That is unique to Luke. I've earnestly desired to eat with you, this meal with you. And he says, now, this is stated in the other Gospels, for I tell you I will not eat it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. But it's stated again. It's reiterated in Luke's account. So there's a special emphasis on this idea of one day, when, whenever that time is, when the kingdom of God is fulfilled, he's going to eat with us again. So it's, it's repeated here. You'll see it in just a moment. Stay with me. See if I can get that. All right. So he took a cup. So in Luke's account, it starts with the cup. 
Now, we always start with the bread. That's what you find in Matthew and Mark. The Lord's Supper isn't in John, but uh, the Last Supper, I should say, where he institutes the Lord's Supper. But he starts with the cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. And that's when he says, for I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the King of God comes. So there's, there's another reference to that idea. So he took the bread, then he takes the bread. So he, he distributed the cup to them. Luke, t Luke is telling us more about how Jesus did it, how he engaged them with the meal. So he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it, he gave to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this and it's only in Luke that we find these familiar words, right? Uh, this do or do this. Rather, the way we would say it in, in English, modern English, do this in remembrance of me. And then the cup again. So likewise the cup after they had eaten. And what does he say? This cup is poured out for you. This is the new covenant in my blood. And, um, and so there, notice some of the differences in it. And very, very important point. And I did give a lesson on... A while back on Easter, back in, I guess that was back in April, on the road, the road to Emmaus. But on the road to Emmaus, Jesus, the, they, the, the two disciples don't recognize Jesus. They don't realize it's Jesus who is with them. And they invite him in. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Leaving off a very, very important passage. Yes. Where he then says to them later when they're arguing over uh, who is the greatest. And notice Jesus mentions he mentions again the idea of reclining at table, sitting at table, uh, in order to teach them a point about that. But then he says, now you're of those who stay with me in my trials. And, and I love, this idea comes to my mind a lot. And I say this when I'm praying, when I'm taking the Lord's Supper. We're about at, what, 56, 57 minutes. Uh, we're, we should be able to finish this in just a few minutes. Stay with me. I know I spent 10 minutes goofing off, so uh, stay with me here. You are those who have stayed with me in my trials, and I assign to you as my Father assigned to me once more the kingdom, a kingdom, so that you may do what? Eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. And then he says, now they have a unique role sitting on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. I think that's showing the apostolic authority and how they were instruments in the hands of God to dictate his will to the church, and there's a lot more to think of along those lines. But, What's happening in, when we take the supper is we're eating and drinking at the Lord's table in His kingdom. I think that's, there's a sense in which that is a reality now, but the ultimate reality of it will be when the kingdom is consummated finally at the end and we are literally in the presence of Christ and we're going to sit down and eat and drink at His table in His kingdom to show the intimacy and the, the joy that we're going to share by being in the presence of the Lord, that's how the Lord expresses that. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that powerful? So then with the disciples on the road to Emmaus, they invite them, and, and they, Jesus talked to them all along the way. And so they invite him in. In verse 30, when he was at table for the love of blueberry Pop-Tarts, he was at table with them, and he took the bread Notice that's very similar to what he says, what Luke says he did at the Last Supper. He took the bread and he blessed and he broke it and he gave it to him, worded very, and very specifically. And that's when their eyes were open. That's when their eyes were open and they recognized him. And so later they tell the disciples, here it is. They later tell the disciples when they find out they, that Peter had seen the risen Lord. In verse 35, they told him what happened on the road and how he was. And I cannot stress this enough. He was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. There's this idea of Christ reveals himself to us. He becomes present to us in the breaking of the bread. So you can think of the table in the kingdom of God as the living presence of Christ among his people. And the Lord's Supper becomes a very important transition for the Lucan theme of, of table fellowship. The idea of uh, having table fellowship with Jesus. 
You see it in the life of Jesus. And then in the Last Supper, that's sort of a transition then to experiencing that in the life of the church. And so it takes us, we don't have time to explore that further, but what a thought. I'll leave that for you to think on. These are some, I think, profound and, and beautiful points, right? And the whole breaking of bread, which that is a peculiarly <laughs> Lukean expression for meals. That's terminology unique to Luke. That points us forward to the coming messianic banquet where, where we have the fulfillment of the messianic age in terms of a banquet with our Lord where we are uh, in festival together. So where we feast together and live together in all of eternity. Now, this is what we're going to finish with. So we're at, we're at an hour here, but if you watched it like you were supposed to sped up, then maybe it's only been 30 or 40 minutes for you. But look at all these themes we have. We, we've seen, let me just pull some of these in here. We've seen the idea of uh, radical reversal. We see the inclusion of outsiders, right? We talked about uh, repentance and the uh, cost of discipleship, the use of wealth, uh, table fellowship. How, how are we going to fit all these together? I want you to see how they actually all relate to each other and they all come together in such a beautiful way. All right. So here, the inclusions of outsiders. Well, we that obviously there's overlap with the idea of reversal because with these outsiders now included, now they're on the inside. That's part of this radical reversal. The idea of repentance or the cost of discipleship well, part of the price to be paid to be a disciple of Jesus is proper use of your wealth. I mean, that's a challenge of discipleship. And that will involve the, the change in my heart where I turn. Repent, Peter says, and turn again. Remember, we looked at those, those terms for repentance to repent and turn, that turning to the Lord will be manifested in how I use my wealth and using it for those who have been excluded and overlooked and marginalized and in need. And uh, we, you can see how all of these things, I'm, I'm going to represent that center there where, where they all sort of come together, where the inclusions of out, uh, outsiders, well, that's one way we use our wealth by sharing a meal with those less fortunate, let's say. And that, that manifests the reversal, and that shows the repentance. Well, that, that all, all of that comes together, you see, in table fellowship. I hope this is coming out pretty well on the video. I spent forever making this slide. Appreciate it! Okay. It all comes together there in the middle in table fellowship. See, because when we sit down and have a meal together, it's showing inclusion. And that's showing the radical reversal where those are on the outside are welcomed in at the table. And the repentance, the change in my heart to where now I, I have a different direction. I've turned to God and now I'm showing God's concern for others when I bring them to the table. And I'm using what God has given me as a steward to share with others in a meal. And so where does all that come together? I want to show you where does where is there an illustr where is there an account in the book of Luke where all of that comes together perfectly? Right there. He was a wee little man. And a wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree for he wanted the Lord to see. In the account of Zacchaeus, you have all of that. You have all of that in that climactic episode that where you see the end of Jesus' long journey to Jerusalem where he finally says, I've come to seek and save the lost. And he went into the home of Zacchaeus who was one of those on the outside because he was a despised tax collector even though he was wealthy. And often the wealthy were despised. But he says, I'm going to use my wealth to feed the poor. And he says, I'm going to restore. There's the idea of his repentance. I'm going to restore fourfold to those I've, what, that I've taken from. And you see a great reversal now with this man humbling himself and showing concern for those 
uh, he has wronged. You're seeing, you're seeing a great reversal where the, the, those who were exalted high are coming down low and those who are low are being lifted up. And it all comes together so beautifully, so poignantly, so powerfully in that account of that wee little man like my wife, of diminutive stature. Uh, isn't that great to think of how, how the Word of God, these treasures in the Word of God, where we, just, where we go beyond just reading through the text, where we, where we exercise ourselves in the challenge of really digging in and thinking about what we're reading and, 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 and drawing back to get the big picture, to see what God is telling us to see what God is calling us to, what God is making us to be, and how He's challenging us to be what we are in Christ, as we often hear that said. I, I could just keep going on, and, and I better stop, because that's something I really want to do, is I, I want to keep talking about this. And what a, what a great thought. That would make a great sermon, wouldn't it? Ah, Miss Olivia. But let's remember, let's remember by the time many of you are watching this, it will... Uh, it will already be past uh, Independence Day, and I hear the signing of the Declaration here. You have it presented by the Committee of Five to the Second Continental Congress in Philadelphia, July 4, 1776. This is John Trumbull's famous painting. I know you've seen that before, but just think of how, uh, how blessed we are, in it. and I hope you had a chance, well, if you're watching this, uh, today, the first, I hope you have a chance to really think about and reflect upon and celebrate uh, all that is uh, the greatness of America. And here's what I'm going to do as I leave you right here, right here. Forgive the, forgive the crinkling, forgive the noise. We got to do it. We got to do it right here. Oh, a fresh package. I know that sounded horribly loud, I'm sure. Oh, yes. God bless you and keep you. I enjoyed our time together in class. Lord willing, I'll see you again soon. Mm. Yeah. Tastes like liberty. Mm. Oh, that's good. So check these out. You got the stars on this one with the stripes on the tongue. And then on the other one, we got the stripes, nice, with the stars on the tongue. And even the little aglets have a happy little, happy little stars on them, a stripe and then star. Yes, and they make my feet feel like liberty. Yes. I know um, I was playful and lighthearted in class and happy and having a good time and all of that, but um, we received some sad news tonight. I'm recording this late. Tuesday night, early Wednesday morning, but we found out that the son of our beloved John and Anna Floyd was found dead. He's 48, he was 48 years old, and they just received this news a few hours ago, and even though you may be watching this much later, I still uh, wanted to say a word of of prayer on behalf of the family in this very difficult time. Our hearts go out to you, John and Anna, and of course your whole family. Um, we love you and we want to be here for you in every way that we can. Please lean on us, let us know what we can do, and know that uh, we're, we're bringing you before our Holy Father. And we're going to do that right now together. Let's, let's pray. Oh, Lord God, Holy Father, 
you know the grief that John and Anna and Greta and her family, that the whole family is experiencing John Jr.'s children. Oh Lord, we ask for your grace, for your comfort to be upon each and every one, especially John and Anna. Lord, you know what it's like to lose a son. And we pray that they would take comfort in knowing that your grace will sustain them. Father, we ask you to hold them close, strengthen them, Father, through this difficult time. Thank you for the wonderful godly example that they set for their son and that they continue to set for their whole family, for the rock of faithfulness that they have been for so many years for their family, Lord. And so we pray that the, the, the light of their faith would be a blessing to the family at this time, that you would be glorified in that as they turn to you, Father, as they seek you for your mercy and your help as you seek to, as you carry them, Father, through, through their grief. Please pour your love on them, dear God. Be with them. For we ask it all in the name of Jesus, our Lord, through whom you have given us such wonderful hope, hope of everlasting life where sin will be no more, where death, where pain, where sorrow will be gone forever. Lord, we, we long for that and we look forward to that. Amen.